All right, so I'm here again with Damien Grant, um, and we're here to talk about shareholder appointed liquidators. So, um, you know, so so Damien, uh, there is this there is this perception out there, uh, and and you know, I may also be a holder of this perception uh, that a shareholder appointed liquidator is going to be friendly to the directors is is this is this true or, or what's your perception as a as a liquidator it's not universally true um but it's it is certainly a feature of insolvency so and i'll just talk to you how, how the incentive structure works so if you're a liquidator, you will have a referral network of maybe 30, 40, 50 people, prim primarily accountants and lawyers. So if you get a call from one of the people who, who refers you to appointments and they say, oh, listen, I've got Nigel, he's a really good guy, he needs to put his company into liquidation. Once you're appointed, if you find that Nigel has an, a grossly overdrawn current account, has traded recklessly, if you then proceed to pursue Nigel, and bankrupt him and take his house. Then that lawyer or accountant, next time they have somebody in that situation, in good conscience and quite ethically, thinking in the interest of their client, is not going to refer that particular insolvent, that particular client to you. And so that places a real moral hazard on liquidators because we know that if we if we take an aggressive approach, we may potentially burn that <clears throat> that source of work going forward. That's one of the things that regulation is uh, is attempting to address. So, if you are a liquidator in that position and you decide not to, to pursue a current account or a breach of duties claims, then the auditor from the regulatory authority is going to ask you, okay, why did you not do that? What was your reasoning and, and thinking behind it? But nonetheless, even notwithstanding that, liquidators have a fairly wide degree of discretion in the decisions that they that they mm. take. Now contrast that with a court-appointed liquidator. A court-appointed liquidator, you've been appointed by the creditors, or at least one creditor, and the creditor is going to want you to take a really aggressive approach. Yeah. And so again, your incentive structure is different. <clears throat> now, um, and certainly firsthand, I've, I've, I've seen examples where people's behaviour, look, you, and you can never know, we don't have a window into people's souls. Um, but I think if you... If you work on the assumption that liquidators are people too, and I realise that's a difficult assumption for some people, liquidators have an incentive to act in a certain way, and it's yeah. going to be very difficult, even with regulation, to really stamp that out. So that's that's in a nutshell why, and that, and creditors can be very suspicious of a liquidator who's been appointed by a director for exactly that reason, yeah. the shareholders. So my advice in that situation is always call a creditors meeting because yep. if you are not certain, and remember, one creditor on their own can call a creditors meeting and get the liquidator, and the liquidator often um, may well respond to uh, an engaged call of creditors. Mm. Well, see, because I'm in this, I'm in this interesting uh, space where. You know, I can wear two hats. So, you know, sometimes I, I act for the shareholders, um, and you know, where I'm acting for a shareholder, you know, my my advice uh, before we liquidate is typically, uh, look, there are things that a liquidator can do, and then there are things that a liquidator must do. So, my role is often to structure the 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 company liquidation in a way that triggers uh, as little as possible of the musts. Um, and then you just you just kind of cross your fingers on the on the cans, um, and 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 where I am acting for creditors, uh, you know, my advice often is let's call a creditors meeting and and roll this liquidator. And you know, if you take a very robust approach at a creditors meeting, um, it is possible to to gain votes. Um, and you know, I should, I should probably take a step back. I mean, the creditors meeting itself is the only real practical opportunity to replace the liquidator. And so if you get the majority in number and value of creditors voting 
to replace the liquidator, he's gone. Um, and so, you know, be beforehand, we, we work pretty hard to get creditors on side and get them voting our way. Um, and, you know, even at the meeting, we're working hard to persuade those in the room. And I've been at creditors meetings where, you know, it's been, it's been, Unsh we've been unsure of whether or not we we're going to get the liquidator out. Uh, and we had, we had people put in their hand up. We had a guy put his hand up and said, Hey, can I change my vote? Um, and you know, before the liquidator could answer, I was, yes, absolutely you can. Uh, and then another person said, yeah, I want to change my vote also. Um, and, and I suppose if all the information they've had has been from the liquidator and then they see this process unfold, it's possible to, to, to change people's minds. Um, it's, it's pretty hard if they've posted, if they've done a postal vote, but, um, but yeah, I mean, my perception often is a shareholder appointed liquidator is, is going to be more friendly to the interests of, of shareholders. And particularly if it's not a reputable liquidator um, who, who doesn't take their obligations uh, to creditors seriously. And, I, and the other, my other advice in that situation is if you're going to do that, you should always opt to get a liquidation, a creditors committee. Because although a creditors committee doesn't necessarily have any significant legal power, it's got some, but it's of no real value. What a creditor committee does, it is a means by which you can continue to engage with the liquidator. And most insolvency practitioners, I've probably got about 400,000 in the books, there's probably about 20 or 30 that I'm actively dealing with at any one point in time. And I need to make a decision about where I allocate my resources because most of these files have nothing in them. Mm. If, um, if I have a creditors committee who is engaged and mm. who wants me to do something and I know that I'm going to have to report to them you know, once every six months when we meet, it's... It's just a squeaky wheel syndrome. And so yeah. if I'm allocating my time, particularly because of most of these guys, I know I'm not going to get a recovery. You're, it's only human to say, right, I've got these files and the creditors seem disengaged. I've got these other files where the creditors are absolutely engaged. Mm -hmm. And I've got the opportunity to, you know, earn some positive praise or, or, or avoid a rebuke then a liquidator is just going to respond to that because liquidators, we obviously yeah. operate in, in the commercial environment where people too. So a liquidation committee does give creditors the opportunity to not just hold the creditors, the liquidators feet to the fire, I think that's unfair, but just engage positively with a liquidator, particularly if the creditors have been successful in changing the liquidity. Yep, yeah. yeah, absolutely agree. And, and, that's been my experience also, you know, squeaky wheel gets the oil and, you know, if you're silent, often the liquidator will be, will be, will be silent also. All right. Well, thank you for your time. I think that's a wrap. It was a pleasure, Mr. Norman. Bye, Clive. Bye. We'll talk soon.